happen. You got it. It's all yours. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Charles. Um, thank you for hosting uh, hosting this uh, these seminars. You know, I, I you know you and I had actually set down this course about two years ago, going through um, the, the kind of information that would be helpful to 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 healthcare practitioners. And I'm hoping that we've actually stayed true, true to our mission, true, true to our substantiveness of these seminars. So with that said, let's get started. I am, uh, I'm on screen two. Can you guys see my screen two? No. No? I, yeah, I, I, mean, I can see, see yeah, yeah, I can see, yes, yes. I can see the screen, you're good. You can see the screen? Okay, yeah. perfect. So let's get started. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Like I said, can I repeat myself? Let's get started. All right, here we go. Uh, so um, I do want to thank Broward County Medical Association all, for also being involved in these in these sorts of informational seminars. And uh, today's topic is pitfalls and challenges in employment law for healthcare practices. Um, so we're going to be touching on a lot of interesting areas of law. But let's get started with the, with the market forces that are in play today. Employment law matters. Um, it actually matters more today than it ever has. So, uh, so employment law, employment matters actually matter today. So that I was trying to play on the words. I guess it didn't quite come off right. But okay, um, it, the reason uh, why we think that the that, that employment law today matters is because there's a whole realigning of healthcare services after COVID, right? So people are, are, are redesigning their processes. People are redesigning the way they actually deliver their services and it's affecting the way they do business. And that employment situations has a lot to do with it. Plus recruiting employees is becoming harder and harder. So what are what is a realistic level of expectation and what is legally obligated is another important question that comes up from time to time. And what do employees want, right? So, 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 so you want to kind of balance that out. And eventually, what we're all looking uh, as employers and employees is a better fostering relationship for both sides. So, you know, it, it matters as to how uh, what, what's written in employment law, and it matters as to what the employers are doing today. And those are the market forces. So, given that, I'm going to give you a brief introduction as to who we are, and then we're going to get started because we do have a long presentation like a fairly packed full of nuts sort of a presentation. My name is Ben Mirza. I actually have several degrees in different disciplines. I've been practicing law for over 20 years. I've worked for large law firms. I've had my own prior law firms with partners before. And this health, Mirza Healthcare Law Partners, we started a, a few years ago. Uh, and really it was Komal, Ed and myself, we all came together to to, to present interesting topics on areas. And we also work on clients together. Um, you know, the person that I'm really have, really excited to have on our team is really Ed Meyer. He is a, is a, a fountain of, of, of knowledge and resources. And he's just got, he is like the encyclopedia of healthcare law. Um, with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to Ed to actually do a little bit of self-introduction himself. Well, thank you very much, Ben. Again, my name is Ed Meyer. I am of counsel uh, to Mirza Healthcare Law Partners. Um, I've been practicing law for uh, 30 years now. Uh, before I actually started practicing law, I actually worked um, for a member of the House Ways and Means Committee at the time. Many of these laws that we deal with today were first being formulated or passed. Um, and then I worked at, uh, as an appointee in the Reagan administration at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services um, at that time. And uh, which inspired me to get my law degree and uh, focus on healthcare law. So I, I've worked uh, in, in hospitals uh, for hospitals, clients for physician clients. Um, and uh, recently I was with Mednax in, in Texas, uh, handling the Midwest division, Mednax uh, being a, a national medical group. Um, but let me also introduce to you Komal Mirza, our associate, uh, Komal. Good evening, and thank you for the introduction, Ed. My name is Komal Mirza. I am an attorney with, with Healthcare Law Partners. My primary practice area is in uh, employment law and assisting physicians establish their practice groups. Prior to joining Mirza Healthcare Law Partners, I was with Legal Aid Service of Broward County, where I advocated for the medical legal rights for foster care children in Broward County. 
I also worked for a US Congressman who was a member of the, of the Ways and Means Committee and um, was at the table at the time of the negotiations of the Affordable Care, Care Act. Um, and with that being said, today's presentation should be very interesting, uh, especially for healthcare practitioners with their own private practices. We're going to cover a lot of um, the main issues or significant issues surrounding employment law uh, for, healthcare pract uh, for healthcare practices. It is important to note that today's presentation is intended to be for general, general informational purposes only. We will not be providing any legal advice. If you do have a specific concern, please feel free to contact us. Remember, this forum is open, live, and being recorded and will be used in the future as an online platform resource. With that being said, I'd like to turn it back over to Ben and Ed, who always enjoy opening our seminars with this quick story. Uh, um, today's seminar is intended for actually HR folks as well. We um, This one is specifically kind of uh, working towards those. But uh, anyway, I, I, I want to thank everybody that's in the room. Uh, we've got a lot of high-end level individuals uh, that have joined our group today. Um, so, so the first scenario that I want to talk about it is a broad restrictive covenant. Just recently, I was involved in an executive uh, uh, agreement uh, regarding a physician that was getting employed by a, a, a particular group. And in that employment agreement, there was a restrictive covenant, restrictive covenant that the physician would no longer practice in the area of healthcare, that they would not go to another competitor anywhere across the, the you know, United States. And uh, which when I looked at it, it caused grave concern. And then I thought about it again. And I, and I spoke with the, with, the, with the client. Then we spoke with the other side. And we said, look, this is really a big, huge wide hole that you've actually kind of created that we're not we're not so sure that you know it comports to what you want or what we want which is that it, it related to that the individual could not go and practice health care in the area of health care at all in the country um, let alone in the state of Florida it was just across the country so it's really a non-enforceable situation so they actually asked for a very specific sort of a a, 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 um, a narrower statement and when they asked us if we would be agreeable to that we went back and said no. We uh, actually talking it over with, um, with with our client. We basically came to the conclusion that that provision was actually non enforceable. So we left it alone. We left open the big wide uh, uh, provision that was sitting out there, uh, only to know that it can't be enforced. It's just 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 the way uh, laws work. Um, so we left it. Uh, you know, so so it just kind of goes to show you, you got to have like a legal strategy in mind before you do enter into agreements. And today we're going to talk about some of those things. Ed, you want to talk about the bonus yeah, yeah, here's a couple of scenarios? Pit, pitfalls, pitfall in the bonus area. Uh, you know, many me times in physician contracts, uh, a physician, you know, they have the salary and then they have a bonus. At some point, they may even be able to negotiate the trade off between salary and bonus. And I remember a case well, several years ago where a, a, a physician decided that you know he'd rather get paid a low salary because he really wanted everything to go into that bonus calculation because he knew he could really clean up on, on the bonus. Well, what happens is those bonus provisions are contractual and in the contract it said you have to be employed at the time the bonus is paid out, which is usually at the end of the year. Um, and it turned out that the physician passed during the year and the family, which was, uh, you know, re relying on those bonus payouts, were now in the position of not receiving the bonus because it gave the employer the ability to say, oh, you didn't qualify for it because he's not employed. He's, he's, he passed away, uh, which created, created an issue. Another issue I've seen in bonus agreements is where the bonus uh, is, it has certain uh, policies to meet and uh, to thresholds to meet, but the, they put the dollar amount of potential bonus, but fails, the employer fails to write the annual thresholds. And then they get to the end of the year and the employer says, well, you know, he, uh, he didn't meet our thresholds and they never specified it. Well, it gives the employee the, oftentimes the opportunity to say, well, the employer's in the position to define those thresholds and I want my bonus and get my bonus if you haven't paid out. So it is very important when you have these bonus arrangements to make sure they're specified in the contract exactly how they work and that you're well protected as an employee for any eventuality. And then the third scenario that we're also going to, going to actually touch on today is 
regarding internships in healthcare. You know, everybody takes on interns, whether you're looking at the medical residents that you're taking on, or you're looking at actually executive, uh, you know, masters of public health sort of uh, interns, you know, what parts of their services when they're, when they're being paid for, when they're not being paid for, when do they qualify for, you know, what kinds of, kinds of folks qualify for overtime payments. So we're going to be talking about that. You know, uh, I always think about my wife who actually went through the whole residency program, worked God knows how many hours in a, re in a surgery residency, and, you know, wasn't exactly paid on an hourly wage, right? So at the end of the day, there were a ton of hours that she would put in. And there were sleeping arrangements there, meaning like on site, do you get compensated for sleeping inside a building while you're working? You know, things like that, right? So today we're going to talk about those unique sort of scenarios. You know, do you get paid for, uh, uh, for, for traveling in between facilities? We're going to talk about these unique situations that are really uh, occur in the healthcare practices quite often, but they're not often talked about. So we're going to clear out some of those cobwebs and touch on those things. So today's presentation in totality, in totality is intended to be about 50 minutes long. We're already about 10 minutes into it, given the scenarios and stuff that were in the, in the backgrounds that we talked about. Um, well, first, we're going to touch on what's going on in the vaccination policies and where we are today and how to set up policies and drug testing, and also regarding drug testing and what the rules are for that. Then we're going to talk about regulatory updates on non-competes and restrictive covenants. And then and then last but not least, it's going to be the Fair Labor Standards Act, the FLSA, the Fair Labor Standards Act. And we're going to talk about what, what employees are treated, uh, 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 how, how the how the law thinks that they should be treated fairly versus what they think that they should be treated. So first part, Komal is going to do, the second part, Ed is going to do, the last part is going to be me. So with that said, I am, I know I'm speaking quickly, but here, I'm going to turn it over to Komal. Komal, please go ahead and be, and uh, it's yours. All right, thank you. So the primary question on everyone's mind uh, these days is, can employers require employees to get a COVID-19 vaccine in Florida? specifically? And the short answer is yes, but there are some exceptions. Uh, the first thing that you want to pay attention to is Florida law, I mean, sorry, federal law and any possible exemptions. The EEO has come out and said that there are no um, prohibitions to employers requiring a COVID-19 vaccine. However, employers need to uh, keep in mind when they are implementing a mandate that they need to provide exemptions under the Title VII, under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, uh, providing religious exemptions, and under the Americans with Disabilities Act, providing for medical exemptions. Um, additionally, it is important to note that although uh, Governor DeSantis has issued an executive order prohibiting vaccine passports, that does not apply to employers. That means that employers are free to implement vaccine mandates. In addition to vaccine mandates, employers are also allowed to have mask mandates. Both of these are uh, important topics, especially as we move into um, the upcoming, the end of the year and the upcoming new year. A lot of uh, the news broadcast is talking, is talking about the executive branch, um, also known as President Biden, uh, issuing an executive order or requiring federal employees to have a vaccine. It is important to note that all federal employers and federal contractors by the end of this year will be required to have vaccine mandates in place. And there is talk about OSHA uh, adding uh, private sector mandates as well, depending on the number of employees an employer may have. Um, with that being said, we do have a basic template available for employers who are interested in implementing a mandate. It is available on our website. The link is provided there at the bottom of the PowerPoint. Next slide, please. And all you do on that on that particular policy is go in there, change the names, and just read through it and make sure it comports to your normal policy. And, and you can run with it. It's in word format. Thank you. And uh, secondly, the next topic that I would like to discuss with you is drug testing and drug testing policies. Primary question these days, especially with uh, medical marijuana having been legalized in the state of Florida, is whether a healthcare practice can implement a drug testing policy for its employees. 
The short answer is yes, and it may be required by federal law. Federal law does require a drug testing policy for employers uh, to implement where um, these specific, um, under these specific uh, circumstances, the primary uh, area of concern for healthcare practices is those who are in the drug rehabilitation services or any healthcare provider or practice that provides or uh, facilitates transportation for for uh, passenger for patients. Um, you want to make sure that you do have a drug testing policy for any commercial. Uh, driver license holders, as well as you wanna make sure that anyone who is an armed security guard uh, at your practice or at your facility is also uh, subject to drug testing policies. It is important to note that overall, the uh, healthcare professions are uh, self-regulated, but there has been recent conversation about have implementing mandatory drug testing guidelines for practitioners and prescribers. And as far as Florida law is concerned, Florida does not require employers, including healthcare practices, uh, to implement a drug testing policy. However, it does allow for drug testing policies to be uh, implemented, especially when an employer is looking at um, bringing on board new job applicants, uh, testing for fitness for duty testing. Um, any anytime an employee comes back from a drug rehabilitation program, it does allow for random testing or testing where there is reasonable suspicion that an employee may be using uh, substances while on the clock or maybe under the influence while on the clock at work. Um, it is important to note that although Florida law does not require a drug testing policy, federal laws and regulations may override that and actually require uh, the drug testing policy. So you do wanna pay attention to that, it, specifically if you are a federal employer or a federal contractor and receive federal funding. Um, and again, if you have questions regarding that, feel free to contact me. And finally, a lot of employers are contemplating bringing on a drug testing policy. It is important to note that when an employer is looking to establish a drug testing policy, that they must provide 60 days notice, written notice of, the, of their intention to establish and implement a drug testing policy. It has to include uh, various language, including the drug use policy, the testing requirements, drug use consequences, um, how or what the due process rights are of an employee in the event of a positive drug test, any uh, drug notifications in terms of what, what type of prescription drugs may alter a drug test and how to provide notification to the employer of such prescriptions. And finally, what the names and contact information for alcohol and drug rehabilitation programs are in the area. It is, it is a good practice to post this notice um, in a visible and conspicuous location in the workplace Typically, most employers will post it in the, in the employee break lounge. And finally, I know uh, Charles would find this particularly interesting, is the medical marijuana use and the gray area of drug law and drug testing. Um, as many of you know, it's federally illegal still uh, to use and possess medical, uh, any form of marijuana but mar medical marijuana is uh, legalized in the state of Florida. There are very specific nuances when it comes to medical marijuana and how it relates to drug testing. If you have specific questions, I encourage you to give me a call. I will be happy to discuss it with you confidentially. It is, you know, it really does get sticky where you have federal laws and regulations and you have federal funding or you are a uh, federal employer. So again, if you have questions, please give me a call. My number is right there at the bottom of the screen. With that yeah. being said, I'd like to turn it over to Ed, who's going to be discussing non-competes. Well, thank you very much, Coleman. One other thing I want to mention to you about drug testing is one may go and say, oh, my, my employer doesn't have any drug testing policy, so 
I'm in the clear. <laughs> but actually, you got to be careful because uh, you may have a hospital coverage agreement or you may be, you know, the hospital medical staff or the coverage agreement will often have provisions in there that will say uh, that the uh, drug testing is required. Or it might say that uh, you, every physician who's covering is has to comply with the hospital policies and the hospital might have a drug testing policy or the medical staff might have that. So always check that too, um, to see what's there. Now, let me talk about the uh, non-competes and restrictive covenants. Uh, first, we're gonna talk about um, the section one of the Sherman Act, that's uh, the big antitrust law, one of the big, many of the many antitrust laws. This goes way back to the early 1900s, uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt era, trust busting, et cetera. Um, but it continues on today. And it's sort of the, the foundation of antitrust, federal antitrust that reaches into the activities of uh, companies and the activities of, of individuals. And it basically says every contract, it's very short, it's actually the language right there. Every contract combination in the form of a trust or otherwise, or conspiracy in restraint of trade or commerce among several states or with foreign nations is declared illegal. Um, and the penalties for violating the Sherman Antitrust Act on an individual is a fine of up to $1 million and jail time of up to 10 years for a company the uh, penalty is um, up to a $100 million of a penalty. So this is a very serious act. Um, and the federal government has been looking in the last several years into the whole employment arena. And um, the government works very slowly. And, but it tells you where it's going. So back in 2016, the Federal Trade Commission, get one of the two agencies that enforce these antitrust laws, the other being the Department of Justice, announced that it will start enforcing the Sherman Act against no poach arrangements. Those are, for, those are agreements between competitors saying that they will not raid each other's employees or they'll not hire each other's employees. Well, similarly, the FTC and Department of Justice jointly issued this antitrust guidance for human resource professionals um, that uh, is guidelines for uh, HR arrange, I mean, HR professionals on employment agreements and employment arrangements. And those, uh, th that uh, guidance touches on these no poach agreements, talks about wage fixing um, and uh, price fixing of between employers or no hire agreements between employers. And what's important to know is, is when you have a, uh, an agreement between competitors between let's say two different medical practices or between a uh, hospital and another hospital that basically says something to the effect that uh, we won't, we agree not to hire each other's employees. That might be considered what's called a naked restraint. A naked restraint is um, such as in the area of wage fixing or, or poaching, no poach agreements are between um, employers, uh, whether they're either directly or you know, wink and a nod type arrangement are per se legal under the antitrust laws. That means that if the agreement is separate from or not reasonably connected to a, a pro-competitive arrangement, there's no uh, consideration of why they entered into it. It's just, boom, it's violation. And now you're in this territory of violating the, NIH, the Sherman Act. So it's very important if, if there is a no hire agreement or a, a arrangement that has to be part of its ancillary sort of side arrangement that's reasonably related to the efficiency of integration and reasonably necessary to achieve pro-competitive benefits. So, so what, do I, what do I really mean by that? So let's say you have uh, a physician group that wants to um, uh, uh, expand into a new area, but they need a subcontract. Let's say they got a contract with a hospital, but they need a subcontract with a competitor, which they can do. They, they subcontract with a competitor, but then, they want to have a no hire agreement. Say, hey, look, uh, uh, if, we're, if, we, if we agree that we won't hire each other's employees, we, now we're together, we're kind of jointly together. Um, and that might be problem, severely problematic, but if it's very narrowly tailored just to this arrangement and just during the terms and you know, only to these particular physicians that are, are, that are, that are there um, being subcontracted, not all physicians or all of a particular area, 
um, that might be okay. But again, that's being ancillary. So it, recently there's been, been several cases, both just generally civilly and in the antitrust enforcement area, in this area of no poach and wage and price fixing. So one was a while back, uh, several years ago, dealing with the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill uh, Medical School and, and, uh, and its hospital system and the Duke University. And that's where a UNC uh, and associate professor decided to go over to Duke and uh, put his resume in there. And they said, we're not gonna look at your resume. He goes, why not? Well, because we have an agreement with UNC that we're not gonna rate each other's faculty. Well, that's, guess what? Sounds like a naked restraint of uh, between competitors not to take each other's people. So there was a lawsuit and it turned out, you know, they ended up settling it, but uh, it, was, it got pretty far uh, on that. And what's also really interesting is it not only turned out that there was an agreement not to rate faculty, but the um, depositions turned out there was actually more of an agreement, not even not to rate other, other areas, other personnel. And now there's a class action lawsuit filed against these systems on that. Um, also more re very recently, uh, Surgical Career Affiliates, um, which is out there in Orlando, was indicted last January by the uh, Justice Department alleged for allegedly uh, violating a um, no poach agreement prohibition in a Sherman One Antitrust Act. And that's where the allegation is they, they or their competitors agreed between them, another competitor, they will not um, hire their senior executives, and that's going through litigation right now. Um, so, so these are very, very important areas uh, to be very, very careful when you're dealing with uh, restrictive covenants, dealing with you know agreements not to compete, even with price fixing. I want to talk about price fixing as a per se violation. So, for example, there was a fellow named um, um, I forget his name, Nirad, Nirad, Nirad um, I forget his name. I don't have his name up here, but but recently he was indicted. And what he allegedly did, he had a therapy, uh, physical therapy company, and he or staffing company, and he went around to other physical therapy competitors and say, "Hey, what do you hire physical therapists for? Let's kind of you know keep the price down on hiring physical therapists." Well, that was a uh, a naked restraint, an agreement to fix prices on what we pay employees between competitors, and he was also indicted, and that's going through the courts now. Next slide, please. What we're seeing too in the area of non-competes is action at the federal level where the Biden administration has noticed and said, look, we have these companies out there that are requiring employees to sign non-competes. And that's really restricting their ability to change jobs where they can't really, they live in a town, they can't go across the street, you know, they're the families and everything. And they can't, they can't uh, compete uh, because they have a non-compete in their, in their employment contracts. So the President Biden has directed the Federal Trade Commission to look at their statutory authority and their rulemaking authority and see how they might be able to curtail unfair uses of non-compete clauses or other clauses and agreements that might unfairly limit a worker mobility. Um, so non-competes are things that they're in these contracts, but it's really important to review them very carefully to make sure that they're very narrowly tailored and not overly broad so that to prohibit someone to really legitimately practicing their profession. Um, finally, that again, keep in mind that even if there's not a non-compete, the employees are prohibited from stealing, right? So you can't raid your employer's trade secrets. Someone can't take employee, employer lists and use those to start a new business. They can't take trade secrets that are in, you know, the intellectual property owned and developed by the employer and use that. And that's what oftentimes the, empl the employers without non-competes will rely upon when an employee leaves if they're taking that, that informa inside information to compete. Well, thank you. That's uh, my summary of what's going on today in this area of uh, restricted Thanks, Ed. Thank you for the update, Ed. Um, okay, so now this is the part where we're gonna talk about the Fair Labor Standards Act. This kind of sets uh, everyone straight, whether it's employees or employers, as to what is required by law versus what people's expectations might be in this environment. 
So the first question that, that, that usually comes up is when you hire a person, are you going to hire them as an employee or as an independent contractor? Some folks that you hire, they're going to say that they want to be independent contractors so they can continue to have their own uh, uh, tax write-offs and you know their own way that they already do business and they're already set up that way and they don't want to be an employee and vice versa. You'll have certain people that, don't, that want to be employees but do not want to be independent contractors because they like the benefits. The primary reason why you need to be paying attention to uh, uh, whether somebody is, 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 is appropriately classified as an independent contractor or an employee is because there are tax penalties related to this and because there are are, are, are often subsequent employee lawsuits that basically say, well, the tax penalties come about because you should have been paying some employer taxes that someone didn't pay because the, 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 the employee was really uh, improperly qualified as an independent consultant and vice versa, that the employee was entitled to certain benefits, like, for example, health care insurance, right? So um, one of the examples that Ed was talking about earlier when we were talking about this is uh, there was a particular employee who was, uh, who was an independent contractor, but for all intents and purposes, they were really an employee, but they were, but they were contracted as an independent contractor. And, and they, let me mention that they like being an independent contractor. They like being an independent, really? independent contractor. Wow, okay. Except so in that afterwards, situation, when? uh huh. Okay, except afterwards, Ben, what happened? Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, just to regurgitate take your story, which I think is fantastic, is the person actually uh, got cancer, and because they were not insured, and uh, uh, um, they had to pay for it, those those uh, those those healthcare uh, expenses on their own. You know, they sued the employer saying that we should I should have been qualified as an employee um, under under the way the, 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 the relationship was set up. So these are now what we're going to talk about are the factors that you look at whether a person qualifies as an employee or as an independent contractor. So number one is is a service that the person is going to provide an integral part of the employer's business. You know, so it's very different if you look at a physician providing phys uh, 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 well, physician uh, um, the services to a physician practice group versus a, an attorney providing uh, 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 law services to a physician practice group. Obviously, I can be an independent contractor, but a physician who's providing physician practices to a physician practice group could also qualify as an independent contractor, but to what degree? Now you got to get into all these other areas. Are they an integral part of the employer's business? Yeah, of course they are. A physician, practice, a physician is very integral to a physician practice group. Is the relationship one of permanency? That's criteria number two. You know, for, for an attorney to help out a physician practice group, it's usually a temporary sort of a relationship. You, know, you go on from subject matter to subject matter, but it can go on for years, but it's very, you know, there's nothing of permanence. But if you actually have a professional on board, then is the relationship long-term and permanent? You really have to look at that. The other thing that you also want to look at is, does the worker bring their own tools to, 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 to work? Does the, does the worker actually work out of their own facility, perhaps? You know, if they work out of their own facility, they are starting to look more and more like an independent contractor. But otherwise, if they're working under uh, um, a, a business's facility and the equipment that they're using is being provided for by the employer, they're starting to look more and more like an employee and like an employee. The degree and control over the work that's being being uh, being handed to the person also matters. You know, does the worker actually have the ability to actually decide what is a profitable or a loss or a losing job? You know, when do they actually turn down a job? Do they have the initiative and the judgment and the foresight to actually take a look at what's uh, 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 look at not only their, their their art, but also at their at the competitors in the marketplace. These are really important factors that determine that. Now, for your uh, for your sake, we also have a twenty point IRS checklist on our website. Um, it's in the in the in the resources section, and you go to forms download, and there's actually a resource uh, uh, um, there if you are are going through this scenario. Um, we're going to move on to the next one. And this one, we're going to talk about interns, right? So like what I was talking about earlier, you have several different types of interns. Some of them are medical residents. That's one way to look at it. And, and then you have others that are actually non-compensated interns. And, and, and right now, I'm going to focus on non-compensated interns, right? 
So when it comes to non-compensated interns, there was actually a 2015 case uh, right here in Collier County. There was actually uh, Schumann versus Collier Anesthesia. And, you know, they actually hired a bunch of interns. And with that, they weren't paying them, but they were, but they were reaping the benefit of the work that the interns were doing. You know, so the court actually applied what's called a primary beneficiary test. First thing that the, that the court wanted to know was, was there clearly no expectation of compensation during the internship? You know, is that stated expressly? You know, if it's in writing, it really works out much better than if it's implied, right? So get it in writing if you're, if you're, if you're not going to compensate an intern. Number two, is the educational environment and the work environment, are there similarities between the two? You know, is there like an education program that integrates into the internship opportunity? You know, uh, if they're getting credit, academic credit for the work that they perform at this, uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the healthcare services clinic, that's obviously better than not getting academic credit. So it starts to look more and more like an internship. Also, you know, the, the courts look at the ebbs and flows of the academic calendar year. Does the internship opportunity begin and end with a or flow with an academic year? What happens during the summers? What happens during you know uh, spring and fall semesters? So that matters. You know the other thing is an internship is intended to be for a learning period, right? So it's intended for learning period. It's not intended to continue on and on to provide an undue benefit to the employer. So they're going to look at that. Um, the other thing that they're going to look at is, does the intern uh, displace any other employees in the workplace? And at the end of the day, does the intern expect a paid job at the, in, at the end of the internship? If there's an expectation of that, that's a little different. So these are the things to look out for for interns and internships, and especially unpaid interns. Right. So you, 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 you want to make sure that that, that uh, if you have unpaid interns, that you're looking at this very closely. And again, for the same reasons that you saw for if, if they're improperly classified, they're actually turn out to be actually employees, you know, and then they either, you know, where employees would actually have benefits, employees would have tax payments and withholding. So you don't want to want to avoid um, uh, these potential penalties or potential risks. Yeah, because there's actually yeah, you're right. There's actually potential lawsuits coming from the from the presumed interns, right? Right. Um, the other thing you know that is, is, it jumps out at you once you start to take a look at interns is what happens with volunteers. How are volunteers different from interns, right? So interns, you know, volunteers think of them as the candy stripers in a hospital. They're doing things for the sake of public service. They actually have a humanitarian objective to actually make people feel better, do better, and heal faster, right? But when it, uh, uh, internships usually have a academic program affiliated with what they're doing, or there's some sort of like a tutelage scenario going on. In a volunteer scenario, it's a straight up public service, religious or humanitarian objective. That's the big difference. And the other thing is, you know, volunteers are acceptable under not-for-profit uh, organizations. But what happens if they're a for-profit organization? I don't think that a volunteer would necessarily volunteer for the sake, for the good of that particular uh, organization, you know, if it's a for-profit organization. So if it's, you know, remember just volunteers are there, are, are, are essentially candy stripers that are there for the public service. And the other thing to keep in mind is volunteers are typically part-time. I have seen full-time volunteers, but those are rare. Um, and when they start to do full-time work for somebody, you know, you really start to wonder, like, why are they actually there full-time? And, you know, it, 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 take, a, take, a, take a closer look at it. But that's the difference between volunteers and interns. Any questions so far? Okay, now let's talk about, um, you know, for purposes of getting paid overtime, let's talk about what's considered a full working day, right? A full working day, the way the FLSA, the Fair Labor Standards Act, defines it is that it is the day, it is the time when the employee starts to engage in work in the beginning of the day, the first compensable act that they do to the final compensable act that they perform. And, the, and that's where the clock begins and runs continuously till it ends till the final compensable act is performed. So, you know, that could be a lot of things in different areas. But it's, it's, it's when they're doing meaningful work towards employment, right? 
However, keep in mind in this day and age when people are doing work remotely, you know, it, the same thing applies. But if they're only logging in remotely to just do a, a simple little task, go in and get out, that's not considered continuous. It lacks the continuity to be considered a full work day. So make sure that, they, that you know, um, um, those things, those lines are clear. Um, the other thing that I, that I found really interesting was, did you know that a security screening for purposes of actually checking into a place before you start to work is not considered a compensable activity? So for example, like uh, for us lawyers, we go to the courthouse, right? When we, when we go to the courthouse in person, you actually have to stand in line. There's like a security line that you go through or you have courthouse employees, which is really an even better example, courthouse employees that are going into the courthouse and they have to go through the security line. There's like a sheriff's office, there's like a metal detectors and conveyor belts and so forth. But by the time you make it through that line, it could be 15, 20 minutes. And when those 15, 20 minutes pass, by the time you make it through, is that a compensable act if for that courthouse employee? Did they actually do something meaningful towards that? Um, you know, the other thing to actually consider is these COVID screenings. A lot of times we had, we had, we've seen clinics where they actually had people get COVID screened before they could even get inside and begin their workday, especially as of recent, right? So is that screening, um, you know, com uh, compensable part of their work? And really what the courts have said is that it's not, it's really not uh, deemed to be convincing. There's, because this, the, the screening has to be an integral part uh, um, a, and an indispensable part of the employee's principal activity. Meaning like when they show up for work, is that screening like an in integral and an indispensable part of what the employee does? No, typically not. It's just a matter of routine that they've got to go through to get in there. Now you can also think of, for example, um, you have um, you have people working in like a high, uh, uh, um, highly expensive warehouse, right? Where maybe somebody stores like some sort of goods that are really expensive. I don't know. Let's think of diamonds. Maybe when they're leaving, the same thing happens. They may be getting screened for their pockets and and all that sort of stuff that no nobody has snuck in anything into their pocket. So there are exit screenings that employers will also do. Is that part of the compensable scenario? No, it's not. So keep that in mind. What's a full work day? What's com compensable? Now, keep in mind that a person is entitled to a meal during a full working day. And the, and the time ring for that is at, is at a minimum of 30 minutes or longer. Okay, so it could be 30 minutes or longer. And it is non-compensated during those 30 minutes or it, or it can be paid for, but it doesn't have to be. It's up to the actual employer. So as long as the employee is completely relieved of duty. So like, for example, if they bring their lunch and work on the desk and continue to work and eat lunch, that's they're not fully relieved of their duty. They're continuing to work on, uh, on the phone, on the computer, but they're still eating their lunch. So that's not a true meal period, right? Um, the other thing to consider is rest periods. Did you know that the 20 minutes or less of, uh, of um, uh, uh, must be considered uh, um, as, uh, 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 as part of the work time? Um, but according to FLSA, the employee is not entitled to a paid for break uh, um, for 20 minutes in duration. That's a, that's a little known fact, but a lot of employers do allow for paid for breaks during the day. Anything you want to add to that, Ed, Komal? I just find it interesting. It's really interesting. It's so important to understand these uh, these break periods and meal times. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, it makes for a really interesting scenario when you've got, like, people that are fighting for, you know, 15, 20 minutes out of the day on different things. And you may be giving away part of uh, the compensation for free when you didn't, when you really didn't need to. So, right. Next, let's talk about sleeping times, right? So sleeping times at a hospital can often play a role in how a, 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 in the work that a person does or how they, how they get compensated. Um, that happens at a firehouse or a fire station in the same way. You can have employees working on a 24 or 36 hour shift um, and you have to take a look at your sleep time policies for them. So, is, so, so, so should sleep time be compensated to non-exempt employees? And the thing is this, um, you know, uh, in a 24-hour shift, an employer can deduct 
for eight hours of sleep time for, for an employee if they meet these four conditions that are listed on the slide. Number one, is there a clear understanding that sleep time is excluded uh, from payment? You know, does the employee know that they're not gonna get paid for the sleeping time? Number two, is, are there adequate facilities at, uh, on site for, uh, well, I guess adequate facilities or nearby that they can actually sleep in, right? And can they, can they get uninterrupted sleep? So for example, a security guard sitting at a desk like this or a nurse sitting at a desk like this and falling asleep does not count. It's not an adequate facility, right? Because they're sitting at their desk, they're sitting at the chair and falling asleep. It's not an adequate facility. So if, you, so if an employer starts to deduct those kinds of pays, you, just because the person was sleeping on the job, it's not really a, you know, not, not a deduction that they can take. The other thing to consider is that the employee must be able to sleep five hours, uh, uh, five, must be able to get five hours of sleep during that scheduled sleeping period. Um, you know, and they have to normally be able to do that. Now, if, if they're interrupted, they have to be compensated for the interruption that, that they have to go through. So if these four, four things are done, the employee, uh, the, the employer does not have to pay the employee for, uh, for, for, for the eight hour period during a 24 hour shift. I didn't know much about this until I actually researched the topic. So anyway, just sharing it with you guys. Yes, sir. Yeah. The other thing to consider is, you know, is travel time to be paid for? And everybody knows, hey, the obvious commuting time between home and work is not compensated for and usually isn't, right? But did you know that when people uh, go from one site, one, one office to a different office and they're at work, they're, they're commuting on behalf of work or their employer, that those are actually compensable times, that those are actually compensated travel times? So that's one way to look at it. Um, the other thing to consider is when when a when a when a non-exempt employee travels out of town, you know, uh, let's say they travel out of town for a single day, they leave, let's say, from uh, Fort Lauderdale and they go up to Orlando. They leave at five o'clock in the morning. They get there by eight o'clock, and they've already they're in it for already three hours. Then let's say they do that. They meet with a client for seven hours then they travel back for another three hours. That's really three in the front end, three hours on the back end and seven hours in the middle. So what's happening, it's, it's, uh, it's really seven plus six. So it's 13 hours that they've worked that day um, for those purposes. But the rules change if it's a multiple day travel. Okay, so that's a little bit different. So what the, what the, what the FLSA says is that the employee must be compensated for traveling on, during normal business hours. So if, a, if an employee you know, travels for two days straight, let's say they go from here to Singapore for, for a 28 hour flight, right? On, a, on that 28 hour flight, they really fly it over a two day period. Well, they're entitled to two eight hour days worth of compensation, not the full 28 hours. They'd be entitled to eight hours during one day, eight hours during the following day that it took them to get there, but not the full 28 hours. So that'd be two days. So that's like the overnight multiple day travel rule that the FLSA has established. And now we're rounding off to uh, closer to the back part of our, of our presentation. Um, what is overtime? So, you know, the other day somebody called me up and said, hey, how do I pay an employee who actually took a sick day and also worked 35 hours during, during the week? So that's 35 plus eight, right? 35 plus eight hours is... 43 hours. So should I pay them three hours of overtime? You, well, no, that's not how it works. The way it works is, is the overtime will, is only calculated into the hours worked. So did how many hours did the employee work? 35 hours. How many hours did they get uh, um, paid, let's say vacation or sick time? That was eight hours. So it's 35 plus eight, that's 43 hours of regular pay. Now, for let's change that example a little bit and make it that the employee works 45 hours within four days and then takes the fifth day for vacation. So what happens there? It's 40 regular hours, eight vacation hours, right? Eight vacation hours. And then you have five actual overtime hours. So, so they would get paid regular pay on the 40 hours, regular pay for the eight hours, and then they would get paid time and a half for the five hours that they actually worked overtime. So the word worked 
quote unquote and underlined is really important. That's how you determine whether an employee gets paid overtime or not. So anyway, just just food for thought, but you know, as administrators, I think it becomes really important, especially if you're responsible for managing employees. Even your medical assistant, if you're a physician, may have questions about, hey, am I going to get paid for my screening? Am I going to get paid for, you know, uh, uh, um, the extra hours that it took me to go on vacation? You know, um, like a lot of times, you know how they say before you go on vacation, you always end up doing all your work before you go on vacation. Then you take your vacation and then you come back and it's built up for you to keep keep working on. Well, I mean, th this will play into that sort of a, a um, sort of a, um, a backup of work. Yeah. So last but not least, let's just talk about what, what kinds of individuals do not qualify for overtime pay. These are typically called the white collar exemption categories. Number one is the executive compensation. I think everybody understands that. Like the CMOs and the, and the high level directors and the VPs and all that, that's the executive exemption. So they obviously don't get overtime because they're usually highly compensated employees that get paid you know, a fair amount of wages and have a lot of responsibility. The second one is actually an administrative exemption, which is which is an employee whose primary duty uh, of the employee is related to the performance of the office, its management and its operations. So if you have a employee that's really like the, the analyst, the academic behind the, uh, the, 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 the performance of the office, then you know what? They're gonna get the administrative exemptions. They could even, that could even include conceivably supervisors. So supervisors who are, who are responsible for, for, for work or the management of a particular small group or an office, that, you could see that playing into that. The third exemption is the professional exemption where a lot of the people that are on, uh, on this presentation would, would qualify under. They would actually get the professional exemption. The professional exemption meaning, are they in medicine? Are they in pharmacy? Are they a RN? Are they a PA? You know, if you happen to have some of those specialties, typically it has to do with like specialized training, like a specialized sort of a four-year degree that qualifies you for a license. You know, things like that, that makes you a learned profession or a professional, like a lawyer, an engineer, an architect, and even a CPA all qualifies under that. You know, uh, then you would be deemed to be a, prof fall under the professional exemption. And you know, when you look at these professions, a lot of them are paid over $107,000. So there's also what's called a highly compensated workers exemption. If somebody's paid more than $107,000, and that was the criteria set in back in January 2020, I think it may have changed for this year. I, I didn't get a chance to look it up um, for today, but, uh, but anyway, it's roughly $107,000, $108,000. If somebody falls within that sort of a bracket, you may want to double check the figure. But if they're well above that, then you know um, they may actually qualify for being exempt from overtime because they are a highly compensated individual. The only caveat being if let's say that the employee is paid $120,000 a year, that they have to partially then perform one of the activities related to one of the other three exemptions that are that are allowed there. So if they are, if they have that sort of an exemption, <laughs> if they have that sort of an exemption, then, um, uh, uh, you know, they're going to not get paid. Over. So with that said, hi, Benjamin. <laughs> okay. So anyway, with that said, I'm going to put Benjamin myself on you. Does Benjamin get paid overtime? Does Benjamin get paid overtime? I was wondering. Say that last question. Does Benjamin get paid overtime? That's right. Does Benjamin get paid overtime? <laughs> On his allowance, yes, yes. Thank you, Benjamin, for that Zoom bomb. Well, thank you for um, joining us all. Uh, yeah. For our, do we have any questions to, uh, on, on this presentation? We're open this for, for any questions. I have. Also, the links that were actually in the slides are in your uh, chat box. Uh, Thank so you, you can actually link those. Uh, I've copied and pasted those into the chat box. You can save the chat by hitting the three dots on the, uh, on the chat box and actually press save, and it'll go into your Zoom file uh, to be able to save them. So do we have any questions from anybody? What about if we stop the recording, then will anybody have any questions? Well, we could do that. Uh, I will stop the recording.